We're continuing on here to our series of messages through John. We were talking last week about the sheepfold, which is Israel. And we're going to continue now with one fold and one shepherd after we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, your word is so powerful. Your word is a guide to us and we just love it because we're hearing directly from you. This morning you're going to tell us that you have other sheep and we praise you for that because we indeed are those other sheep. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit is working in every heart now to open it, that these words may penetrate and be used because we have a tendency, I know, Father, to daydream a little bit, to maybe make some plans in our minds about what we're going to do later today or maybe tomorrow. But I pray that we'll focus, give you these few minutes to hear your word and hear some comments about them. Now, Father, we fully understand that your word stands for itself and we don't need someone to tell us what it says, but it aids us as we study your word to be as detailed as we can. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would enlighten the word for us today. Again, so those words would just jump off of the page and we would see things we've never seen before. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the salvation that comes to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we pray in his wonderful saving name. Amen. John 10, beginning at verse 16 this morning. Our Lord is speaking and says, Another sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. There was division, therefore, among the Jews for these things. And many of them said, He is a devil. He's mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Remember that Jesus said that the reason that man was born blind was for the glory of God. And we see right there at the end, can a devil open the eyes of the blind? That blind man is still witnessing. He's a powerful witness and he's not even there. Earlier, Jesus said, I'm a good shepherd. We're very familiar with that. Probably from the time you were in Sunday school years and years ago as a little fella, you learned about the good shepherd. And it's important for us to remember that the sheepfold we talked about last week is Israel. That's an important thing for us to grasp. We need to take hold of that. And now Jesus tells us, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, then also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. All right. Jesus clear, clearly tells us that there is going to be other sheep. There are other sheep out there. He's standing now talking to the Jews. He is in Israel. He's in Jerusalem. And this is other sheep out there. And they are going to be brought in. But those sheep are not part of the sheepfold of Israel. These other sheep are not of that sheepfold. These are other sheep. That's why it was so important last week that you grasp the fact that when Jesus is talking about those shepherds who brought their sheep into the sheepfold, he used that physical to demonstrate the spirit. He's talking about Israel. He's talking to the Jews. He's already talking coming out of Judaism. He's talking about coming out of that sheepfold. He called them out from under the law, from ritual, and from the rabbinical legalism that had taken place by that time. He called them out of the old, and he called them into something new. But who, just who are these other sheep that Jesus is talking about? Now, I'm going to tell you right offhand, these other sheep are not the sheep that the false religion of this world tells you. Jesus came to this country and he preached the gospel to the Native Americans and to us. He's not talking about that. That's a false teaching from one of the great false religions of this world today. The sheep Jesus talks about here 
are the people who lived outside of the nation of Israel. Gentiles. He's talking about us. Remember back the uh, Greek woman who asked Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter and Jesus said basically it's not right to give the food that's meant for my people to the dogs. You know, the dogs are a reference to the Gentiles. And the answer that woman gave is beautiful. She said, but don't the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table? And they are marvelous crumbs, folks. They are wonderful crumbs for us. Because when Jesus came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but here He says, I've called my sheep out of Israel that are going to come. I'm calling the rest of you now. There's that, those crumbs to the world. Jesus is very clear. He says, there's going to be one flock, one shepherd. One flock, which consists of Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, bond and free, male and female, red, yellow, black, white, from every nation, out of every language, out of every tribe on this earth. There's going to be one flock, and that one flock has one shepherd. The name of that flock is the church, and the name of the shepherd, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul describes it over in Ephesians 2 in this matter, beginning verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye, he's talking about us, being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision, Israel, in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now is Christ Jesus, now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, that is, we are now one with God, who hath made both, that is, Jew and Gentile, into one body, one flock, he hath broken down that middle wall of partition between us, and having abolished flesh, the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, to make it himself of twain one new man, and so making peace, that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross, that's the church, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, that's us, and to them that were nigh, Israel, the church. You see, the other sheep, the Gentiles, who hear the voice of the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, they will follow him. They hear the voice, just like those of Israel who believe, they followed Him. Why would the other sheep follow Jesus? Because they heard His voice. It's that simple. The great praise of this verse is that it is speaking to us. We heard the voice. Now, I'm not talking about an audible voice. And I'm not saying that you saw bright lights and angels coming at you, but you heard the voice of the Lord because someone read you the Scriptures. And one day it became real to you and the Holy Spirit called. You had heard the voice of Jesus. We who are not of the sheepfold of Israel, but we who hear the shepherd's voice and respond, that's us, the church. We all have heard and recognized His voice but there's a sad part of this. Most people will not hear. They won't hear it at all. The marvelous thing that since we hear His voice, we have a good shepherd to lead us. He's also the door to allow us the freedom to come out of our evil past and into the glorious light of an eternal future, all with the acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Savior. What we also see here is something that so many people miss, a clear distinction between Israel and the church. And it's very, very clear. And I know I've harped on this over the years, and I'm going to harp on it again this morning. I, you cannot stay under the law and enjoy living in the freedom that comes under grace. It's just not possible. There has to be a separation. I don't want to live under the law. If we just take the Ten Commandments, forget about the rest of them. 
Just those ten. Matter of fact, just take the nine because the Sabbath is not mentioned in the New Testament to be commanded. We can't keep the nine. It's a heavy burden. But we live under grace. Our sins are forgiven. You see, so many people miss those important words when they try to confuse Israel and the church, try to bring the things of Israel into the church, bring law into the church. They miss these words. Thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now remember, the church isn't mentioned in the Old Testament. It's not there. And understand that what God gave Israel is for Israel. And what God has given the church, it's for the church. But with the promises of Israel, we don't get them. We're not going to get the land. We are not the seed. We're not Israel. We do get the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant. That's Jesus Christ. Remember the Abrahamic covenant, land, seed, blessing. Jesus leads us out from, from all that behind, all that law, all the, the burden that carries. And you know what? Church, look at this. There is no command in Scripture to return to the law or legalistic religion. You don't go back. No command whatsoever. You know, Christians got to rejoice in the fact that we are not bound under the law, but we're free under grace. It doesn't mean we're free to sin doesn't mean we have a license to go out and, and, and do things that we're not supposed to do, but it just means we're not under the law anymore. Remember, this, the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Jesus Christ. But when we come to Jesus, we don't need a schoolmaster anymore. We have the great shepherd. Jesus said plainly, there shall be one fold and one shepherd. One fold and one shepherd. He's talking about the church. He called out the believing Israelites out of the sheepfold of Judaism into a new creation. The church. You know, the early church that began on Pentecost it was at least 99.99% Jewish. I can't help but believe that maybe a Roman or two heard Peter's sermon that day and was saved. But it's predominantly a Jewish church made of Jewish believers. But I want you to remember something about the church. It's a mystery. That is, it's something that's not revealed in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, Paul does not reveal it to us through the Word of God until Ephesians 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote forward a few words. A mystery is something not yet revealed. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Here it is. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and the partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The mystery is now told. That's the church. One flock, one shepherd. That's the mystery revealed. You know, when we talk about a mystery in Scripture, it's not like a mystery novel. It says it wasn't revealed until later. You know, God put the Bible together perfectly. It's progressive revelation. He could not open this book with revelation. The revelation, you wouldn't understand it. So He puts it together piece by piece, dispensation by dispensation, and it's perfect. The mysteries are solved. There are many mysteries that are revealed in the New Testament. So there are two distinct peoples. But whether you're a Jew or Gentile, there's only one way of salvation. And that's by the grace of God and your faith in Jesus Christ. And then you're part of the church. You're part of the church. I remember years ago, Dana may not remember it. Earl asked her, said, are you a member of Israel or are you the church? You remember the question? The answer is you're part of the church. And your ancestry is Jewish, but you're part of the church. You're no longer Israel. You're the church. So when the rapture happens, you're going up with the church. So the next thing the Lord says to the religious leaders was strong. It was powerful. And of course, they couldn't take hold of it. They couldn't grasp what he was saying because they're spiritually deaf. Jesus said, therefore, doth my father love me because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me. 
but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Jesus tells them, and again, it's very clear what he says here. He doesn't mince words. All of this is the will of God the Father. The Father loves Jesus Christ, loves his Son. He always has. He always will. And Jesus willingly obeys. He's obedient to the Father. And as a result, Jesus tells him, the Father loves me because I died for those sinners. I'm going to die for them. I'm obedient. You know, Paul writes over in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now that is true and powerful love. That's the word agape. That's a divine love. That's the love that we need to strive for. Because you know what? We're never going to reach it. That's why it has to be stronger every day. And you know, Jesus himself describes that type of love in John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Just think of that type of pure love. That's powerful love. Not only did Jesus die for us, but he suffered more than any man had ever suffered in the history of creation. And no one will ever suffer more than Jesus did. You know, people say, well, let's, this fellow suffered. He did this. He went through that. He didn't go through what Jesus went through. Jesus not only suffered physical pain, and we can kind of relate to the physical pain, but he suffered spiritual pain. Our sins placed on him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You see, that is a suffering that we can't comprehend. We have no knowledge of that. There is no way that we can ever know that suffering of sin. You say, we were conceived in sin, we were born in sin, we live in sin, we have a sin nature, we're accustomed to sin. You know, that's why when somebody tells me, well, I was in heaven for 15 minutes. I'm going to tell you what, if you were in heaven and you came back here, you would go mad. Because all of a sudden, the sin, you would feel it because you've been in a place of perfection. That's what we can't understand. That suffering of Jesus. That's, you know, He was sinless. He's a perfect Son of God. He knew no sin until He took ours. He took yours. He took mine upon Himself on that old rugged cross. Jesus also suffered when God the Father turned His back away from His Son during those terrible three hours of darkness that He hung on that cross. God cannot look upon sin. And so we hear those words of Jesus from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A pain that we cannot imagine. Jesus also said, I thirst. And it's kind of funny because after last Sunday evening service, Chad asked me about this very verse. And we talked about it for a little bit afterward. Most people think of Jesus as I thirst, that he was talking about physical thirst. Oh, I want something to drink. Well, I believe that he thirsted because he missed that relationship that he had with God the Father because he was alone there taking our sins upon Himself. He was separated for the only time in eternity. Jesus thirsted for that relationship with the Father to be returned. And we know that it was restored. That relationship once again came together. How do I know that? How do I know that it was, everything was restored? Two words. The resurrection. The resur Jesus paid it all. He said it is finished. Unto thy hands I commit my spirit. And the resurrection is the proof that God accepted that sacrifice and that Jesus Christ, the Father and the Son are together again. The light came. The darkness went away after those three hours. Three terrible hours. So it's obvious that since Jesus willingly laid down His life and shed His precious blood for us, 
out of that much love for us that we need to love Him. You know, I just don't hear Christians profess their love for Christ as they should. You know, Jesus Christ made His soul an offering for sin. Our sin. As I mentioned a few moments ago, it was during those three hours of darkness on the cross that God the Father placed upon the Savior of the world our sins. I can't imagine what He went through those three hours. Keep in mind, Jesus Christ went through hell for you and me. The Good Shepherd, our Good Shepherd, gave His life for the sheep. He gave His life for us. He took the cross for us. He took hell for us because He loves us. When you read this passage, our Lord Jesus makes it clear that He willingly laid down His life for you and for me because He loves us more than we can understand, than we can even comprehend. There are so many misconceptions about the situation of Jesus' arrest and His crucifixion. A great many people miss the fact that Jesus was in total control of the entire situation from beginning to end. People think, well, He was arrested. He was forcibly taken. He was forcibly beaten. He was forcibly tried. No. He was in control. Jesus was in control of where and when the arrest would take place. And whether or not you understand it, Jesus was in full control of the trial before the Sanhedrin and even before Pilate. Even the exact time of His sacrificial death was in His control. Never forget God. Jesus is totally God. I know the world says Jesus is a good man, a good teacher. They may even say that He was some sort of prophet. But Jesus is God. And I don't care what, the, what lies the world says about it. They can't cover up the truth. You can lie all you want to, but the truth is the truth. Jesus is God. The Jewish leaders said Jesus' arrest and crucifixion shouldn't happen on a feast day or right at the feast day. We can't have that. The religious leaders had no control whatsoever of that. They were merely instruments in the hands of God. They were used to accomplish God's perfect work of salvation through Jesus Christ. It's amazing. God even uses non-believers to accomplish His will. He bent Pharaoh to His will. He bent these men to His will. Now let me tell you something else about Jesus Christ who lived on this earth as a peasant. We talked about that last week. By the time He was born, the, the line of Judah, the line of David had been reduced again to that of a peasant. And Jesus lived as a peasant. Nowhere to lay His head. But I want to tell you what, He was never more kingly than when He was walking to that crucifixion. He was never more kingly than when they drove the nails in His hands and feet. The fact of the matter is the king is supposed to lead the way. He's supposed to lead the way in battle. He's supposed to lead the way which is right and correct before the Lord. And the king is supposed to die for his people if that's what's needed. That's not true today, of course. The leaders of nations hide away from the battle as far as they can get, sometimes hiding in bunkers. But they're not going to be in the front lines. Jesus, our King, led the way for our eternal freedom. He fought the fight. He won the battle. He won the war. He was never more kingly than on that day, was He? On the day of crucifixion. Jesus Christ is victorious and because He's victorious, we're victors. We've, we're part of the winning side. We have eternity before us. Matter of fact, Jesus was so kingly, He made an impression on that battle-hardened Roman centurion. Do you remember? Over in Mark 15, 39, the Roman centurion says, Truly, this man was a son of God. He was close. He almost got it right. This man is the Son of God. The Roman centurion put it past tense. He was. He is the Son of God. But Jesus' kingly manner upon the cross made a powerful witness to who He truly is. God in the flesh. Emmanuel. God with us. 
If you read the Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John very carefully, you'll see that it was not Jesus who was on trial. Oh, that opened a few eyes. So well, I've read him many times. He's been on trial. No. Look at it carefully. Actually, it was the Roman government that was on trial. It was the nation of Israel that was on trial. And don't miss this. You and I were on trial, not Jesus. We were on trial. And that's the reason that Jesus remained silent. He wouldn't ask them because we're guilty. He's standing in our place. He's our high priest. He's our intercessor. He's our sacrifice. He couldn't say, he couldn't defend us. He could defend himself. But we're guilty. And he's taking our place. We're on trial. There's no defense for us. No defense for our sinfulness, our rebellion against God. No defense. Everything Jesus endured was really a punishment that each and every one of us deserve. The fact is, take a deep breath. Jesus did not have to die. What did he just say? Did I hear the pastor say Jesus didn't have to die? Of course. If he hadn't, we'd be facing eternal damnation. You know, Jesus could have looked around at this world. He'd been there for 33 years. He had seen all sorts of perversion. He had seen people worshiping the creation, not the creator. He could have looked around and said, these sinful people are just not worth it. Let them go to hell. Hmm. See, Jesus at that point knew what man was. Yet in, in despite of our wicked condition, Jesus, out of love for us, took our punishment, He took our cross, He took our hell, and He did it willingly, take the sins of the world upon Himself. So you and I could be free from our sins, forgiven, and have eternal life. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame. Isn't that powerful? For the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross. Joy? Going to the cross, that's joy? You know what that joy is? That's every believer that's here this morning. Every believer in every church this morning. Every believer that's homesick this morning. Everyone that ever accepted Jesus Christ. That's the joy that was set before Him. If Jesus didn't love us, He would never have gone to that cross. Well, can you, would you consider it a joy to suffer as Jesus suffered? No, He wouldn't. But He willingly laid down His innocent life for the guilty. There was no man who could have taken His life from Him. No man. No nation was powerful enough. The Roman army couldn't have done it. You know, we know that at the end of the tribulation, are the armies of the world gathered at Armageddon. And here comes the Lord with all the church saints, with the angels. And all He does is speak a word, the sword of His mouth. Could Jesus have destroyed the Roman army? Certainly. He had 12 legions of angels at the cross. And I bet they were ready to fight for Him. He never gave the command. There was no power which could have forced Jesus to carry that cross. There's no power that could have nailed Him to it. He died willingly for you and me. And there's something else which is wonderful. Jesus not only willingly laid down His life for us, but He had the power to take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment I received of my Father. Now I can see those religious leaders scratching their head. He has the power to take His life back up again. This is very special, isn't it? That's a powerful verse. Because someone to take up their life again after they've died? You know, I've been to a number of funerals over the years, and not one time has the guest of honor gotten up and gone home with me. Not once. You know, 
What Jesus makes here is a statement of deity. God and God alone has the power of life and death. Jesus' words did exactly what they do today. They caused a division among the religious leaders. And probably any of the people that heard too. Some of them said, he had a devil. He's mad. Don't hear him. Don't listen to him. That's what the devil wants you to do. He would love for you to think that Jesus was a madman who had a devil. Don't listen. But, you know, think about that for a moment. The devil would love for you to believe that, but if he was actually belonged to the devil, there'd be a house divided among itself, as Jesus said before. And it would fall all to pieces. But the others heard. And they understood something. He doesn't have a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? No. Now don't get me wrong. Satan has a lot of power. But not the power over life and death. He doesn't have the He can imitate. You know what else? He can't be but in one place at one time. I say this many times before. Probably no one in this sanctuary today has ever met the devil face to face. He doesn't have time for people like us. But you've met a lot of demons, I guarantee you. But here again, that, that blind man comes up again. How could someone who was a madman or, or filled with the, the, the devil, how could he give that man his sight back? The Pharisees already said, it has to be someone of God. Think back to when Jesus asked his disciples, so the man sinned. Remember that response? Neither has this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. The works of God manifest in him. Some of the people saw and realized that. This man is who he says he is. We see that happening here. Some of the people realized only God could do that. You see, people still could see the same thing today. That's right, they could read this portion of Scripture with an open heart, asking the Holy Spirit to show them the truth, and they would see that Jesus healed that blind man and He is of God. You know, remember the crowd on that day that the man received his sight said, well, a demon could never have done what he did. Talking about you, demon couldn't have done it. So there was a division. And why was there a division? The answer is very simple. It's explained in Scripture, and here it is. They were not His sheep. They didn't hear His voice. It's that simple. Why don't people come? more people come to Jesus Christ today? They don't hear His voice. They're not His sheep. They just stick their spiritual fingers and their spiritual ears and go on. His sheep will hear. The others will not. That's the same issue we see today, exactly the same as it was then. And there are only two possible choices. Either Jesus is a madman or He is who He says He is. He's the Savior of the world. He's the Son of God. He's totally God. You see, Jesus is either a demon or He's the Son of God. There's no other possibility. For the last 2,000 years, there's been a division. And I'm going to tell you, if the Lord leaves people on this earth prior to the rapture another 1,000 years, it's still going to be the same division. During the tribulation, it's going to be the same division. I've got news for you. When we get into the kingdom, the last part of the kingdom, we're going to have that same division because it's going to be a rebellion. When Paul preached in Athens, some people believed, some didn't. When I preach, some people believe, some don't. And it's sad, it's very sad, but it's truth that when that we cannot expect things to be any different today when we talk about the Savior. It's not going to be different tomorrow or the next day. There's going to be a division. There's going to be some on one side, some on the other. And some play neutral, but there is no neutrality here. It's black and white. And I've read some of the thoughts and teachings of these so-called liberal theologians. And I find that they are without a doubt some of the most inconsistent, illogical people I have ever heard. They make no sense. They're about as wishy-washy as you can be. 
They believe this one day, this something else, but they never seem to find the truth. You see, contrary to their thinking, Jesus Christ cannot be a good teacher only and a good example. How many liberal theologians preached it? He was a good man, had good teachings, but as far as being God, you know, that, whew, that's terrible. You know, he's got to be more than that. He is God. He's the Son of God. You know, Jesus is either a fraud or he's the Son of God. I don't know how easy I have, but plainly I can make it. Jesus places the world, places you on the horns of the dilemma. You see, that's that division. You know, people, I, I don't know. I've never seen a mountain split. I've never seen the sun stop. I've never seen a river part. I've never seen the dead raised. I've never seen the blind healed or the deaf. I've never seen it. Open your spiritual eyes. It's here. Stories tell us. And he is Jesus is a madman or he's the Son of God. He's your Savior. Again, the choice is yours. There's no, and there's no middle ground. It's black and white. Don't walk down the center of the road. You know. You can walk down this side, it's pretty safe. You walk down that side, it's pretty safe. You walk down the middle, you're gonna get run over. Take the side of Jesus. Do you believe or not? I mean, that's the whole thing. Do you believe or not? Faith. What do you believe? Simple faith. And you know, the Lord doesn't say that you have to have a great faith, does it? How big a faith do you have to have? Size of a mustard seed? Tiny. But I'll tell you what, that mustard seed grows big, doesn't it, afterward? That's where your faith is. Believe. And then you have to ask yourself too before I close, are you really truly saved? What a question. How can you ask me that, Pastor? I'm asking you because I love you. Are you really truly saved? If the Lord came back with His church right now, would I still be sitting in this pew? If I died right now, where would I go? Are you really truly saved? Because now is the day of salvation. Do not put it off. Jesus has already paid the price. It's like going to the movies. The price has been paid. You have the ticket. Are you going to use it or not? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, when I began, I didn't really intend this to be a salvation type message as it was. But You put it on my heart and we put the words out there. And I pray right now that You're working in every heart because the question is, am I really truly saved? Some people could be just fooling themselves and we don't want that. We want them to be able to say, I know that I'm saved. I believe, I know Jesus is the Son of God. I know He died for me and that's what I want these people to say. And I also want them to tell others how much they love Jesus. He loved us so much that He died for us, Father. And I want us to be able to tell people that we love Him so very, very much. Work in every heart here. Have your Holy Spirit tugging at those heart strings for whatever need there is in each life. And we know that He will convict us, but we must follow. Take charge of every life, every thought now, Father, and have it turned to You in acceptance of our Savior. Thank You, Father, for those who have turned out today. I ask Your blessing upon them that they would have a wonderful Lord's Day and return the next appointed time. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.